Divine Truth Theme Discussions Discussions between Jesus and Mary about specific topics and issues This is session 13, part 1 of the discussion God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance, where Jesus and Mary continue to discuss God's principles and laws of forgiveness and repentance and the role of the human conscience, answering questions relating to the conscious mechanism itself, emotions, and parental and societal beliefs. This session was recorded on the 21st of March 2018 from 11 a.m. in Wilstel, Queensland, Australia. Welcome back, everyone. I'm here with Jesus today, and we are mm. continuing. <laughs> we're continuing our discussion uh, in our series about forgiveness and repentance, and in we're up to session 13 today, and this is our final session. It, it, we've We've taken from session nine to 13 to discuss the conscience, God's mechanism of the conscience in detail. So today is our final session on conscience and we're gonna be discussing just some specific questions about uh, the conscience and how it operates. Mm. Should be good. Yes, it should be very interesting. Okay. Uh, just trying to, we're just trying to tidy up people's concept of it because we've already noticed that people's concepts are <laughs> sort of a little bit off still when, when it comes to the feedback we receive. So what we're going to do first is review the sessions. I know we've done this so many times now. We've 13, actually done it. Well, no, this will be our 13th <laughs> yeah. time. But uh, we just want to just briefly remind you that, you know, because this is session 13, you'd be, and you have, if you haven't seen the other sessions, you're better off watching them in sequence. And uh, sessions one to three basically covered just a basic introduction to what uh, repentance and forgiveness is all about, God's laws generally. God's truth about specific things, particularly about forgiveness and repentance, and uh, and what sort of it all meant emotionally as well, what yeah. forgiveness and repentance meant emotionally. So that was our first three sessions. That's right. And then we decided um, that we needed to, in order to fully answer people's questions, not only did we need to give that preliminary information about forgiveness and repentance, we needed to give some other information about other very important laws and principles and mechanisms that pertain to that whole process of forgiveness and repentance. Mm. So so then from sessions four to eight, we discussed compensation and what God's God's principles and laws are pertaining to the, to compensation. Mm. And then, of course, we've got onto this very interesting topic of the conscience. And uh, so from sessions nine onwards up until today, we're, we've been discussing the conscience itself and what it is, the mechanism, how it works, and that every soul has one. <laughs> and, uh, and, and this particular mechanism is often confused with other things, which we'll talk about a bit more today. Mm. And so, so now we come to today's session. Yeah. And today's session is more on just trying to answer people's questions and trying to resolve sort of outstanding uh, misconceptions, really, yeah. about what the conscience really is. And, and also trying to address issues of um, the different, uh, different flavours of questions. In, you know, we firstly want to look at the mechanism of the conscience itself, but also we want to look at uh, things to do with emotions and the conscience, like, how, you know, obviously we said the conscience is... Uh, God being able to transmit God's emotional feelings of, about and thoughts of, to you, you know, facts about how God feels about mm. things. And, and that, of course, uh, opens people up oftentimes to uh, questioning, well, what are my feelings? What are God's feelings? What are spirit's feelings? And so forth. And these kind of questions all need to be addressed. And we also uh, are going to address the issue of, you know, how the conscience gets affected in its development and its sensitivity yeah. and you know particularly the influences that society and parents have upon the conscience and what we can do to actually encourage our children to develop their conscience mm. so these are the kind of questions we'll be covering in <laughs> that, this session that's right so we're looking at three major areas aren't we the, mm. the technical and these are all things that we have covered previously in sessions 9 to 12 but this is just an opportunity for us to discuss some kind of pointed questions uh, that we've received from listeners or that have come up mm. um, 
just about the technical nature of the conscience, the emotional nature of the conscience, and then the effect of family and society upon the conscience. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, our first set of questions are going to be questions about the technical nature of the conscience. Mm. So, Jesus, would you like to just introduce us to, um, there's sort of three core areas we're going to focus on with regards to the technical questions. Yes, we sort of expected that there'd be more questions about the 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 function, uh, the the way the conscience actually functions, but there hasn't been that many questions about that. Uh, either we've been very clear, <laughs> or, or people don't understand it very well. So um, we'll see what comes up in our discussion today about yeah. what we can do about addressing those particular issues. Yeah. And there's also the issue about how the conscience differs from things like compensation. Mm. And the ramifications of compensation are emotional. Yeah. In other words, we have emotional responses to compensation. But, and obviously the ramifications of the conscience are that if we're receiving thoughts from God about God's th- thoughts about things, then, then that's going to have some kind of impact upon us emotionally because that, that's going to be contrary in many cases, to our own thoughts and feelings about something. And of course, we also want to look about uh, whether it's actual, actually possible to shut down or destroy the conscience mechanism. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting concept, isn't it? Mm. Because uh, on Earth, there's uh, at times people are portrayed as having no conscience whatsoever. So we'll talk yeah. about that as we go on in this yes, section. that's yeah. right. Yeah. What's the difference between conscience and compensation? Well, I suppose to discuss the difference, we first must compare some very basic fundamentals, which we have covered in the last, you know, eight sessions or so between conversation and conscience. But, but obviously the primary fundamental point to consider is just this, this. The conscience is the mechanism that exists in the soul that allows God to transmit truth to the human soul. So, so it's just a receptor of truth. That's it. it it's not emotional it's not it doesn't cause pain it doesn't cause pleasure necessarily either in in the moment it's just information information that has no real emotional connotation aside from the fact that it is god's feelings about things so so it is how god feels about that particular thing but but it's information the compensation process is a completely different thing Mm. it's a it, it compensation results generally in uh, pain or pleasure, but pleasure only results if you obey the laws of love, and the pain only results if you uh, disobey or or attempt to disobey the laws of love, live in disharmony with love. Mm. And so they are two completely separate mechanisms from one another, and, and they don't really have any relationship with each other except by the effect they have upon us when we have the effect of either compensation or the effect of obviously hearing information from God that's in disharmony to my own concepts or my own belief systems. Yeah, and I guess uh, this question and the next couple of questions that are going to follow this in this session, they really stem from um, this idea, this feeling that comes up sometimes when we learn about compensation and... and, um, and conscience so quickly you know we we just had all these sessions about compensation and then about conscience and and it can start to feel like oh my goodness look i just feel bad what's the cause of it you know (laughs) there's all these technicalities going on but i just feel terrible and so that's a little bit of a preamble to this question in the next couple um so you've told us the very specific mechanics of the differences Mm. um is there any other factors that we need to consider in that um well, obviously, um, when it comes to feelings, and we, we're, t- we're going to be talking later in this session more about feelings and our responses to the conscience and so forth. But when it comes to feelings, obviously, our feelings are our own feelings. So, so, and that applies in all in everything that we do. Like, so, if someone comes up to you and punches you in your in, in the arm, your feelings are your own feelings. That you, your response to that are your own feelings. You can't blame the other person for your feelings. They are your feelings. Mm. Now, people can push you into trying to have feelings and people can try to manipulate you and they can try to hurt you and all these other things. But 
But your feelings are your own feelings. And we need to firstly see that. And so that being the case, because the conscience is just a mechanism by which we receive truth, our feelings about the truth are our feelings. Mm. They're not God's feelings, they're our feelings as a response to feeling or hearing God's feelings. <laughs> it's a lot of feelings though, isn't it? Because <laughs> we're sort of feeling God's feelings or, or understanding God's feelings through the conscience. Well, and my, we a lot of times the feelings. conscience mechanism is, is, is really giving us God's thoughts. Mm-hmm. But God, because God's thoughts are transmitted emotionally, obviously they come via emotion. But yeah. that's all they really, it's, it's just information. Mm-hmm. It's not, uh, there's no signature to it or in, an emotional impressions that God, God is trying to give us. He, he is not attempting to make us feel anything mm. because to do so would be out of harmony with his laws of free will. So he's not trying to make you feel bad or good. He's just allowing you through the mechanism of the conscious to know what is right and what is wrong. Mm. That's all. Yeah. And compensation is, is a little different in that when we break a law, we now have feelings that we're going to have to feel about having broken the law. And all the laws measure our feelings yeah. and respond to our feelings. Mm-hmm. So compensation is very much about the painful feelings or the pleasurable feelings that we receive as a result of either being in disharmony with or in harmony with the law. Mm -hmm. Conscience is not really like that. Conscience is just the delivery of truth, full information. That's Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. It, it, uh, it, it, There there is no uh, emotion, any emotional response we have to it is our Our emotional response. And we need to stop saying that things like, oh, I feel bad because of my conscience. No. Your conscience is a really good thing, and it's always a good thing. If you feel bad, it's because of your disharmony with it. (laughs) It's not because of the conscience mechanism itself. We often blame our conscience for feeling bad. Mm. And, and, you know, this is a, 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 it demonstrates a misunderstanding of the conscience itself, because the conscience can't make us feel bad. Mm. It's just information being received. That's all. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So right. that's a primary so thing to is, bear in mind. It is. Mm. And I feel like, you know, you've made that very clear in previous sessions as mm. well. Um, perhaps if we could just um, compare the two processes, if you like, uh, of conscience and compensation, just uh, briefly, mm-hmm. um, just to sort of round out this point. Sure. So I guess one of the primary things we have to say is that if there is a relationship between compensation and conscience, it's that um, often we feel corrective compensation when we ignore our conscience, the conscience. Is yes. that correct? Yes, you could say painful compensation, which is always corrective, always comes about because we have ignored the truth and ignored love. Mm. So we, we've taken a action, a decision, where, and this remember we've defined our behaviour as any thought, so we can even ignore truth and love in our thoughts, yeah. as well as ignoring truth and love in our feelings, and also in our behaviour, mm-hmm. and whether that behaviour is towards ourselves or towards others. We can, we can ignore truth and love and just, and just go ahead with an unloving or an untruthful manner of dealing with those things. Now, if we do that, we're basically going to be butting our head against the law. Mm -hmm. Now, as we've talked about previously, like in all of our assistance groups in particular, um, you know, laws are immovable. Mm. God's not, they're not negotiable from God's perspective. So every time you butt your head against the law, the only thing that's going to get hurt is your head. (laughs) (laughs) It's like bashing your head against a brick wall. The brick wall's not going to move Mm -hmm. and it's only uh, yourself that's going to be harmed. And, and this is the, the same thing we need to consider here. It, when we bash our head against the law and we decide that we are not going to be truthful and not going to be loving, then obviously corrective compensation is going to come in the form of emotion. Now, most of us, as we've just talked about in, ses- in what was it, four to eight, sessions four to eight, we talked about we all try to distance ourselves from our emotion. Yeah. And one reason why we try to distance ourselves from our emotion because there's emotional pains that result from us butting our head against the law and we want to ignore the pain. Yeah. 
and, and still go ahead with what we believe we should be doing, which is frequently out of harmony with love. So that's a very different thing than just the conscience. The conscience is, some, is a mechanism, obviously, where you're just receiving truth. That's all. Mm. You know, it's not. Mm. Uh, it, and as I said, the truth doesn't have a, a, a good, bad, guilty, shame, and it doesn't have any of those other emotion, emotional signatures to it. It just is what it is. Yeah. And, and our response to it is the thing that changes, obviously, depending upon our condition, our desires, our, our, even our desire to sin has an influence, as we've discussed yeah. on the operation of the conscience. Mm. Mm. Okay, well, um, we'll I just run you through then a list of examples that we've written here mm. that are, it's just really comparing the operations of compensation versus um, conscience. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So the first one is that experience of painful emotions such as guilt and fear occurs due to corrective compensation as a result of attempting to continually forsake love and truth and deny the operation of the conscience by pleasing others demands or avoiding the attack of others so really you've just spoken to that haven't you yeah yeah, yeah so uh, we've said quite a lot already Com it's quite simple compensation results from trying to ignore the truth mm. now you could almost say, couldn't you then, that compensation results from trying to ignore your conscience or yeah. act in disharmony with your conscience, yeah. bearing in mind that the conscience mechanism itself is there to deliver the truth yeah. to you. Yeah. So, so, you know, obviously this means that compensation is the result of not living in harmony with truth and love, yeah. whereas conscience is just a result of wanting to know from God what God's opinions are. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. All right. Um, the second example we had was that children want to believe the version of right and wrong that parents taught them. So children often be attempt to do what our, what our parents say is right and call this our conscience. Yes, and, and, and they call it, uh, most, uh, most people would call that the conscience because, because that's what the parents have called it you know you do what I want yeah and then you're doing the right thing and so yeah. many of us finish up growing up believing that our parents version of what is right and what is wrong which I think is our next point is is actually the correct view of what is right and what is wrong and as a result of that most of the time we're not listening to God on any matter yeah we're only really it's like we've got our voice of our parents sitting on our shoulder mm. And the way that happens is that we are now emotionally, we have emotionally accepted our parents' belief systems and structures generally. Yeah. And also the society's belief systems and structures too. We have the same, it has the same effect upon us. And to a large degree, we accept quite a lot of these belief systems and structures inside of us. So it's like we carry around society and we carry around our parents with us. And then because um, our parents and society are almost, <laughs> well, very often they're, they're almost diametrically opposed to God's view, yeah. but sometimes not, you know, sometimes, sometimes they're sometimes quite, quite on closely some things, aligned. Yeah, on some yeah. things they are, you know, like yeah. the average parent on the planet would probably not agree with murder, you yeah. know. And so they're in line with God's yeah. view there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the average parent on the planet basically also believes that children should do what the parents say they should do. And in that case, they're diametrically opposed <laughs> to what God believes on that matter. <laughs> so, yeah. so there are areas in life where the parents are accepting of God's mm -hmm. viewpoint. And there's areas of life where the parents are not accepting or in direct opposition to Point. But obviously in those cases, when we've taken on our parents' view and called that our conscience, and then we act in harmony with what our parents would say is right, which is actually wrong, then we're going to incur compensatory of course. correction. Of course, because we're in direct disharmony with God's laws, and every time we beat our head against God's laws, we get the same results as our parents got when they beat their head against God's laws, <laughs> which is pain. You know, yeah. that's, uh, that's going to be the net result of that action. You know, ironically, though, when you, start to stop, when you start to accept God's laws, if your parents don't accept God's laws, now you begin to beat your head against your parents' laws rather than God's. So, so in other words, it's like to go against, like many times, to accept God's laws or accept God's truth 
Mm-hmm. You must go against society's truth and get against society's laws and against your parents' laws. And usually society and parents don't have a very good reaction there. That you know, they often turn around and start punishing you yes. for accepting laws and principles that are not theirs. Yeah. And there's a lot of reasons why they do that. Some of those reasons are very selfish and others are based around fear and, and other kinds of emotions. It, it doesn't really matter what the reasons are. Yeah. All that is really happening is that because we now are accepting God's truth, God's principles as our manner of living, it is in direct disharmony with our parents' truth and society's truth as to the way you should live. Mm. And because of that disharmony, now you're going to be going against your parents. Now, because most people are not measuring compensation yes. as a painful experience, they feel going against their parents is a more painful experience. Mm. Mm-hmm. Very true. And they feel going against God, God's just going to let him get away with everything. Yeah. But, but usually after they pass, they realise the big mistake of that. In going against God, that's, that then becomes the most painful experience. Mm. And it's always been the most painful experience. Yeah. It's just that we're detuned from it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So true. Yeah. Okay. So um, going back to our example, often then we're blaming the conscience for our pain when actually it's our sin that's creating the pain and it's or, the, or the sin of others. Yeah. So we, we could be uh, um, engaging our conscience and going along with our conscience because it tells us to do something and then we get punished by the world. Mm. So then we have some pain and then we say, oh, that's because of our conscience. No, it's mm. not. It's because of the world's unloving condition mm. and their sin. It's got yeah. nothing to do with your sin if you're following the truth. Yes. So, you know, we've got to be very careful about what is causing our pain. And that's one of our future questions. It is. Mm. And you know what? I, I feel like we've talked about a lot of these principles. In in fact, I think it was in our previous session. It, it It's quite powerful to think of examples, though, mm. because often that makes it more real, doesn't yeah. it? So I'll, I'll be thinking of examples <laughs> as we go through this discussion. Okay, I think I think we've covered the next point pretty mm. solidly. I think we've covered pretty much. I think much. we've covered. And if you look at sessions, I think it was eleven or ten. I can't remember now, but where we discussed the parental influence upon the conscience, I think yeah. it should be very clear to everyone who's listened and watched that how the parents have influenced them to detune from God, uh, and to detune, if you like, from God's voice coming via the conscience mechanism and instead tune into the parents' voice, you know, all the time. And eventually we end up just, like I said, carrying our parents around on our shoulder, yeah. whispering in our ear even when they're not there anymore. Yeah. Because of, because we now have these, uh, the parental belief systems have now become our own. Yeah. Mm. That was session 11 we talked about. Session 11, was it? Yeah. 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 So is our pain always the result of our unloving behaviour? And this, this follows on a bit from what we were just speaking about. Um, well, yeah, I sp- you could say in answer to this question, um, I'll give a succinct answer at the end of the explanation. <laughs> okay. but, but you could say there's many factors that are involved in creating our pain. Mm. You, you first got what type of pain is being created because we, we can have physical pain in our body. We can have emotional pain and we can also have spiritual pain, actually. In fact, the entire world at this stage is in a deep amount of spiritual pain. Mm. Um, and this pain exhibits itself. Spiritual and emotional pain also exhibit itself, themselves in our body. Mm. So they, they result in physical pain. So firstly, we've got to look at the types of pain. And so physical pain is a lot about our resp- our denial of emotional and spiritual pain. Yeah. And our desire to fight all that. Yes. And, and therefore receive the compensatory corrective painful experiences emotionally which then also then cause uh, physical pain to exist in our bodies so a lot of physical pain is not just like caused by other people hurting us Uh it's most of our physical pain is caused by us hurting ourselves by bashing our head against the brick wall of God's laws. Yes. <laughs> and that's uh, where most of our physical pain eventually comes from. Mm-hmm. So we need to understand that's one type of pain. 
Another type of pain is this emotional pain. Yeah. Emotional pain. So this is like emotions about, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, there's so many songs nowadays about the pain of love, you know, and how hard that is and everything. All these emotional pains come from disharmony of, in, in, again, with regard to God's laws in terms of how God's laws operate morally and ethically. Mm. So, so, so now every time I'm out of harmony with God's laws ethically or morally, I'm going to have some kind of emotional pain. And, and, and most people probably on the planet would agree that emotional pain is often worse than physical pain. Mm -hmm. And most people on the planet also avoid emotional pain more than they avoid physical pain. Yeah, very true. They, in fact, many of the situations that people don't want to embrace mm -hmm. are all because of their emotional pain rather than their fear of physical pain. Yeah. And, and, and I find it quite surprising sometimes that most people are willing to have a lot of physical pain and still do their enjoyable thing. Yes. You know, like things like drinking, in, uh, you know, Al getting drunk every night, or you yeah. know, alcohol abuse, or any of that it causes I intense amounts of physical pain. But, <laughs> but you know, we do it anyway because we're really avoiding emotional pain. Yeah, or slaving hard at the gym. Yeah. Or um, uh, there's all kinds of things that we do physically in order to uh, either to avoid emotional pain. Yeah. yeah to really. avoid emotional pain or to attain some sort of addictive pleasure, which is about which is about emotional our emotional pain. pain yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's like to look good or whatever else it yeah, is yeah, that we're trying yeah. to do. Yeah. So so we've got our emotional pain, and that, as I said, is a, is where we're breaking the laws of morality or ethics with regard to our life. And then we've got the spiritual pain, which is, which is the most intense pain. It actually creates the most intense pain, both spiritually, emotionally, and physically, all, all in all areas is the spiritual pain of doing things in disharmony with God's love. Mm. That is the thing that causes the majority of pain. That's why I said in the first century that the sin against the Holy Spirit is the worst sin. It's the most painful sin. <laughs> it's so, the biggest thing you can do to cause your own pain. You know? <laughs> and so you, you're talking about um, uh, emotional pain comes when we're out of harmony with morality, which is essentially out of harmony with God's love and truth and Laws. Well, it's but more to do we... with ethics uh, than morality. So in other words, it's more to do with my being out of harmony with what is the right way that I should treat everybody and what's the right way that I should treat myself and so forth. Mm. The, it's, if you like, it, it's where we're out of harmony with the perfect natural love, the condition of perfect natural love. Mm. Uh, whereas the spiritual pain is where we're out of harmony with God's love, God's love and truth specifically. So can I ask you about that then? Because, I mean, how much of our spiritual pain is about just not wanting to love the way that God loves or live the way that God would like for us to live, as opposed to the actual rejection emotions, the feeling of wanting to be self-reliant and to reject a, a direct relationship with God? Now, I know the two are somewhat related. Well, yeah, but... I, I don't know if you can divorce them, to be mm -hmm. honest. Like, it, it feels to me like... Um, Sometimes we try to nitpick, but everybody, everybody is different. Yeah. Everybody has a wide spectrum of different kinds of emotions and wide spectrum of injuries. We basically can say that all of our compensatory pain comes about from resistance yeah. to love and truth. Yeah. Our resistance, our mm -hmm. internal resistance. Now, where our internal resistance to love and truth comes from can be thousands of different and sometimes hundreds of thousands of different ways mm. that our resistance to love and truth is developed yeah. and every single person has a different flavor of that based mm -hmm. on their upbringing their nature their personality and you know so forth and, and the choices they've made in their life so i don't think you can be too specific about all of that it's it's very individual which is why in the spirit world people are given individual help because yep. uh, it's very rare uh, except when you're educating it's very rare to give uh, help to a person to progress without it being just for them. Mm -hmm. And you educate large groups, but you help individuals gotcha. generally. And, and, and of course that applies if, if a group of people have the same injury, then you can help the group. But, but everyone has different injuries in the long run and sooner or later that's exposed. Sure. And, and so we need to see, so, so firstly, we've looked at this sort of type of pain. Yep. So we can see that there's really the three main types of pain. So, so the question was, is our pain always the result of our unloving behavior? Mm. Now we can see that in each case of pain, if it's physical, well, somebody else might've hurt me physically. Yep. So, so it's not always the result of 
my unloving behavior that mm -hmm. I get hurt physically. Mm. Someone else might attempt to hurt me emotionally, and particularly that applies in my childhood. Yeah. So, so my emotional pain that I have now is not just as a result of my decisions to be unloving, mm -hmm. but they're also the result of my family of origins decisions to be unloving. Yeah. And spiritual pain is the same. In fact, spiritual pain is very much a society collective in a lot of cases. So society has these common viewpoints about, you know, life, about fear of death and fear of violence and a number of other things. And this justifies all sorts of pre preemptive violent acts. And, and what, we're, what we're doing in these cases is saying, well, yeah, we can cause it ourselves, but other people could cause it to us too. Yep. So, so we need to understand that, yeah, there's these types of pain, but if you look at the types of pain, it, they can be caused by ourselves and our actions or others and their yep. actions. Yep. Then if we look at the source of pain, um, you can see that a lot depends upon the decision-making of individuals. So if we could be more specific to that, the main source of pain is when somebody chooses to do something that's out of harmony with God's love and truth. You can basically nutshell it down mm -hmm. to that statement. That's where all pain comes from, just that one statement. But it, we, we can open that up again and go, okay, that's harm caused to myself or others because I've got you know, sinful desires, harms caused to myself or others because I've got addictions, mm -hmm. harm caused to myself or others because I just want to get what I want and I want to be selfish and I want to take actions that are selfish and I just, I don't care about anybody else, you know, and, and there's all sorts of, you could go, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's hundreds of things that we can do there, isn't there? To, but it all boils down to one thing and that is we are attempting uh, for whatever reasons, mm -hmm. some of which come from our history, some of a lot of which come from our current decision-making processes. Mm -hmm. we are some of them are educated and some are uh, igno sort of uh, ignorant choices. That's if right. you like. Some yeah. are educated choices, yeah. some are ignorant choices. Yeah. Uh, some are also what I'd call denial choices, where yeah. you can obviously see someone's hurting from your behaviour, but you still do it because yes. you want to, and you just ignore the fact that they hurt. Yep. Or you can obviously see that you're hurting from your own behaviour, but you still choose to do it because you get some other kickback for it. You know, yes. and a, a great example of that is all the physical addictions, like overeating, overdrinking, uh, you know, and all those physical addictions. You can see the results of it in your body and you can see the mess it's making, but, but <laughs> you want to ignore it for some other reason. But it all boils down to just this one thing, really, which is the primary source of our pain. And that is we just want to remain doing things that are unloving or untruthful out of harmony with God's laws, out mm. of harmony with God, God's love or truth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's our source of pain. Now, again, if you look at the source of pain, you can see it could be others that do it or it could be us. Yep. So the question was, what are, you know, am I... Unloving actions always, always what's creating because of my me? pain. Yeah. No, they're not. Yep. They're because of other people's unloving actions as well as yeah. yours. Yeah. You know? So it gets down to that. And then the third question, part of this question is a very interesting part, and that is how soul condition affects your pain. Hmm. Because before you're at one with God, Pain uh, is like you can f feel pain in your own body and in three main ways, the, your physical pain, your emotional pain and your spiritual pain. These pains are created to an extent by your own choices and decisions because you're, you're doing things out of harmony with God's love and truth. Mm. But once you become at one with God, from that moment on, you have no pain caused by your own choices or decisions. Mm. But you still may have pain caused by other people's choices and decisions. And But could I be experiencing emotional, spiritual pain at that point, or is it just physical pain? Just physical. Yeah. Um, and usually it's a lot less intense because there's no emotional or spiritual connection with it. Yeah. So because there's no emotional or spiritual connection with it, it's much easier to manage and control. Yeah. Right. But it doesn't change the fact that your body has limits. You know, if somebody if somebody breaks your arm on purpose, it's going to hurt just for the instant. And then and then in a person who's at one with God, 
firstly, they can fix it fairly well instantly. So there's only a momentary pain. Mm -hmm. But uh, and they can detune uh, their body functions can be such that they can detune from the pain. They're aware of its cause. They can fix it up straight away and the pain's gone. And so, so it's a very momentary th experience, but it still happens. Mm. So we can see that our soul condition, uh, how we respond to spiritual and emotional pain in particular, is very dependent upon our soul condition. Mm. And if our soul condition is good at one with God, then we, we will not have any emotional or spiritual pain left to address. To address. Mm. And, and it will only be physical pain that other people have caused that yeah. we will ever have to experience. Mm. So that was my uh, state in the first century when I died. Mm. I, was in, I was in some physical pain, of course, mm -hmm. hanging on a state where you get, uh, you know, your body tears itself apart. It's quite painful. But you can detune from it to a degree you can manage it to a degree um, and and it's momentary you know it's momentary you know it's not your fault yeah so it, it's able to be managed well a lot of times physical pain is a heightened experience we were just speaking about this this morning because either because we resist and fear the physical pain um, or we have some kind of aspect of worth or emotional component attached to the pain like yes. you hit your thumb with a hammer and you think i'm an idiot for doing that and that actually does heighten the physical pain in, in a sense that's how it, it um, occurs for me anyway yeah um but, but as you say the fear is the major thing the fear yeah. inside of you emotionally is a major reason why we feel in quite sometimes quite intense amounts of pain mm. fear fear is the biggest cause of my pain right at the moment yeah my fear of future things that I'll, I know I'll eventually have to get around to doing. <laughs> that, that is what is causing a lot of physical pain. And, mm. and once you're beyond that and you've released that, you know, fe that fear, mm. then the pain also goes, it disappears completely. Mm. And I've had plenty of experiences of that already in my progression. And anybody who's sincerely progressing wouldn't have noticed that themselves. Yeah, mm. yeah. So, okay. that all being said, yes. <laughs> the final answer to the question. So the question was, the exact question and was... My, is, are my unlove, is my unloving behaviour always a source of my pain? That, yeah, so is our pain always caused by our behaviour? Mm. No, it's not. It could be caused by our behaviour mm -hmm. or it could be caused by somebody else's behaviour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so no, it's not. However, we can say this. Pain is always caused by somebody's unloving yep. <laughs> behaviour. <laughs> Somebody had to be unloving before we could experience pain of some kind. Yeah. Right. Now, in the majority of cases, it's us that's unloving because God's not unfair and he doesn't go, he doesn't go, right, all your emotional pain and all your spiritual pain, that's a result of somebody else, you know. He, he, the laws of compensation work in such a way that it's our error that is attempting to be corrected by the law. Mm. So we've got to bear that in mind. Mm. But yes, there are times when somebody else can cause us pain. And, uh, and a good example of that is in our childhoods. And pain, though, that we can release, that we have the capacity to let go of. Mm. And it's only our resistance to that that causes even more intense pain. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's what we need to bear in mind. So, so, so while our pain isn't just caused by our own unloving behaviour, a significant portion of it is. Mm. And therefore, we can cure a lot of our own pain, significant, a, a significant proportion of it, by curing our own condition, yeah. <laughs> rather than focusing on somebody else's. <laughs> yeah, and, and um, the final note that we'd written here is that pain caused by someone else's unloving behaviour is always easier to release than the compensatory pain that I accrue as a result of my personal choices to yeah, be unloving. Always easier. Yeah. And you can see why, because most of the time when you choose to be unloving, you have already got quite a set intent mm -hmm. inside of yourself mm -hmm. that says, 
I justify my unloving choices. Yeah. And, and a person who's justifying their unloving choices is a very much more, is, 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 is very susceptible to large amounts of future pain. Mm. But on top of that, they uh, generally don't care about the pain they cause others. Yeah. Um, and so that is a big problem on the planet. There, there's very little care about, you know, how we affect other people with mm -hmm. regard to our choices and decisions. And here I'm not talking about the standard of, oh, you've hurt me, so, you know, you're wrong but rather God's standard of, has the person actually been hurt? Yeah. And in most cases, when you look at the situation here on earth, yes, you know, the person has, has actually been hurt because of our choices and decisions that we're unloving. And, and the more we do that harms others, mm -hmm. the, more, the more pain we are going to experience in our life. And it's gonna be far more intense than any person's decision to harm us mm. for us. Mm. And that's a thing to bear in mind. Yeah. Our choice to harm others causes far more pain to us in the long run than others' choice to harm us. Yeah. And yet what we're fighting against is others' choices to harm us yeah. in most cases. Yeah. So that's an irony. It mm. is an irony, isn't mm. it? Yeah. Mm. So, so then can the conscience tell me why I'm feeling bad, why I'm feeling pain? Yes. Now, remember the conscience doesn't, cause you to feel bad. So this is very important to mm -hmm. say firstly. But yes, the conscience can tell you why you feel bad. Because you think about it, God knows why you, why you are feeling bad. Mm. What, whatever the bad feelings are that you have, the painful feelings are that you're experiencing, God knows why, why you have them. Mm. He, he made you. He designed your body. He designed your spirit body and he designed your soul. He knows everything that's going on in them. So he can just tell you, yeah. you can just say, yeah, here we go. This is the reason why you feel bad here. And this is the reason why you feel bad there. You can do that. But, and, and, and so, so this is, and if you think about that, that that's a beautiful thing. Like, because in, imagine how we'd work out otherwise, why we feel bad. We'd have to do all these scientific experiments to work out what would cause us to feel bad and where, and whether the relationship was physical and what we eat or what we drank or whether it was emotional and what we did today and what decisions we made, whether it was belief systems. And we'd have to, you know, there'd be like thousands of different types of criteria we'd have to measure yeah. if we were doing a scientific experiment about why is it that you feel bad right now, mm. right? It would, wouldn't it be a lot simpler to just go, why do I feel bad? Oh yeah, no worries. You know, I've got the answer to why I feel bad. <laughs> you know, that's a lot easier. And then you can work on that, that particular thing. Yes. So, so yes, it's a beautiful thing that God has done, giving us this uh, clear, with the potentiality of a clear indication about why we feel what we feel at any point in time. Yeah, it seems to me that you know, if you're going to have a conscience, one of the loving purposes of it would be to to let you know what's going on, uh, you know, for yourself even if you at any given moment. Mm. Yeah. If you want to know. I, and I guess that's the key thing, isn't it, is that m most of us don't really have that sincere desire to know or we'd know a lot more, wouldn't that's we? That's right. Yeah. That's right. We don't, we don't care to know. Yeah. And, that, and that's where our main problem is. You know, in the first century, I said, keep on seeking, keep, keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. Yeah. And, and that's, a, that's a real truth in that, in that if you de develop and demonstrate a sincere desire to know things, you will come to know them. Mm. That's, that's what I've found my entire life. Mm. And, and that's the way it's going to be for everybody. So, so if we don't know them and we don't, and, and we don't finish up experiencing them ourselves, it's only because we don't have a sincere desire to know. Now, you can't expect a child to have a sincere desire to know because it hasn't got a developed intellect, to, you know, and a developed, a developed uh, desires or motivations to know, particularly up until sort of seven or eight years of age. Um, but by the time we become an adult, we need to develop some desires to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, whatever it is, we, we, we can know anything that, you know, God's, God's an infinite being with an infinite amount of knowledge. You can ask him anything. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's really interesting, isn't it? And again, this is something we were speaking about privately this morning. I mean, um, it, I know for myself, there's a lot of times where I feel ashamed of myself and, I, and I, that's my whole life. Um, and I can look back on periods in my life where I realised that the people around me preferred that I feel badly about myself than do anything differently. 
uh, or, or confront them in any way. Um, at, and then at other times where I feel that perhaps I had some connection to morality or ethics or maybe even my conscience and, and I, you know, could sense that what I was doing was wrong and then I felt some shame about that as a result of my own response to that. Mm. So, but what we were discussing um, today was just the motivations we can have for not wanting to know why we feel bad. So mm. uh, very often... It, say for myself, it's preferable to blame myself in a situation rather than confront the truth that actually I'm being harmed here because that might lead me to have a further moral decision that I'm going to have to take some action which uh, limits this person's ability to do that to me, which may be, depending on our context, I may have to speak directly with them, I may have to make changes in my life where I, they're no longer in my life. All of these things can trigger fear, mm -hmm. and so we we have a preference for even shame and blame of self over the experience of fear. So mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of reasons why we actually don't want to know why we feel bad. Yeah, we're very slippery characters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and particularly, and the poorer our condition, the slipperier we are. Yeah. Usually, you know, yeah. it's it's very interesting to watch uh, how many many times. You know, there are many motivations for avoiding truth, mm. but all of them are not helpful. Mm. But, but they are, some of them are learned and, and taught to us by our parents. Yeah. Some of them are learned by our own experience. And some of them are uh, decisions we make yeah. just to avoid our personal pain. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of it is about not having any faith in God or any mm. faith in truth. Mm. Uh, and if we correct those particular things, then we'll have a lot more openness and desire to know what the truth is, no matter what it is. We yeah. can always know no matter what our condition, and that's the beautiful thing about the conscience. Yes, that is the, the um, it equals the, levels the playing field, doesn't it? You know, that anyone can know yeah. what the matter at hand is right now if there's sincerity in their desire. Yeah, yeah. you're God's child, right? Yeah. So God's not like a nasty parent. God's, every single person who's ever lived and whoever will live is God's child. Mm. As God's child, God wants to inform you. He mm. wants to tell you why you feel bad, why you feel good, what's going to make you feel good, what's going to make you feel bad. He wants to inform you, but he's not going to force that information down your throat. Yeah. He's going to wait until you want to know. And, yeah. and that's, a, that's what a good parent would do, surely. Yeah. So, you know, he's always trying to do that. He's treating us at, at, at the best any parent would ever treat us. Mm. And we are frequently just ignoring it and then wondering why we're in so much pain. Yeah, and we're kind of um, idiotic in a way, aren't we? In that, like, we, we're not logical because we, we you know, prefer state. We, we have this grade of pain, like, oh, that pain's going to be worse, so I'll just hang out with this pain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, oh, the pain got a bit worse, you know. So it, 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 we, we're just choosing between a catalogue of pains, basically, rather than seeing that the, the reception of truth might actually get us out of pain altogether. With yeah, but the, the, the other irony of it, isn't it, is that the reason why we're in pain is because we're already not wanting to know what the truth is. <laughs> That's what I mean, <laughs> and, and yeah. Yet, and yet we, we spend our whole life managing pain without spending our whole life managing the question about what is truth. Yeah. And, and this is where our focus is wrong because we're, we're, we're so hooked up in the primal aspect of our life. Mm. Uh, in, the, in the Paget messages, we've referred to it as the animal part of us, the mm -hmm. animal nature. We're so hooked up into that part of us that we, that we end up staying so connected to this primal part of us that, that we don't go, hang on a sec, what's causing this primal part of us to feel so much pain? Mm. It's actually because we're ignoring truth. Mm. We're ignoring God's way of doing things. And, so, and, and what is the mechanism of truth? The conscience is the mechanism to receive truth. Mm. So, so by, by denying the operation of the conscience because we might feel something, mm. feel bad as we call it, mm. and we're basically denying any future happiness to ourselves, except coming via some kind of hard personal experience. Yeah, a, a dramatic personal experience, mm. yeah. So, but would you say, you know, you talked about the animal nature, would you say just any desire to avoid emotion, av avoid the experience and sensation of fear is us living in our animal nature? Yes. Yeah. Of course yeah. it is. 
Yeah. You know, God designed our soul to cope with any emotion, mm. and therefore the emotion of fear is just another emotion. So our desire to prevent our fear is just a part of our animal nature. Yeah. Well, animal do, animals do that, yeah. but, but we, we are a human soul connect to an animal, mm -hmm. connected to the physical body, and the human soul, which guides our entire system, ha has a capacity to go get higher than that. And, yeah. and so whenever we connect just to the animal part of ourselves and, and fulfill its appetites and, you know, and, and its desires, while at the same time trying to prevent its fears, yeah. um, we are basically uh, walking completely away from our soul yeah. and also completely away from the conscious mechanism that tells us the truth. Yeah. And the truth, ironically, is going to make the animal part of us have no fear and no pain yeah if if it's properly adhered to and and, and, and allowed to govern our life so it dissolves a lot of that um you know the the does it dissolves the, all of it not the, a lot of it um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. but it dissolves the obsession with the survival of the physical body yeah. with the Air, acceptance all of, it, all of, of the village you know with like all of those kind of very the, the worry instinct, about what violence, we call instinctual the worry about violence yeah. the ha, ha, worry about being harmed the the worry about not having enough to eat sleep you know mm -hmm. drink mm -hmm. and and the worry about not having enough to wear and the worry yeah. about you know you, your house and your property and you and all of those worries dis disappear completely because you're you're a bigger being than these things these yep. are physical things that the physical part of you needs but the soul knows you can create them anytime you can get them anytime so why do you have to worry about them all the time yeah you don't worry about them at all yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. very yeah. good all right so the conscience is the mechanism that can tell us why we feel bad but it's also the mechanism that can make us feel better <laughs> <laughs> if we respond positively to of what course, we hear of course yeah yeah, yeah but yeah. without hearing the truth we, we have no mechanism to feel better yeah mm. yeah why does my conscience bother me or why do we say my conscience is bothering me it's a common statement <laughs> it isn't is. it on the planet uh, you know, it's, it, probably the statement itself indicates that we have some misconceptions about the conscience itself. So you, you'd have to, in answer to the statement, go, let's look at the basic fundamentals about the conscience. Firstly, it's a messenger of truth. And now if truth bothers you, then probably the messenger of truth might bother you. <laughs> but it doesn't direct me to do things. It, do, it doesn't tell me to do things. It just tells me, informs me. It tells me what's right, what's wrong. It doesn't even belong to me, really. It's a mechanism in my soul, but God is the one who's giving through the mechanism the truth. So it's actually God's truth coming via the soul-based mechanism of the conscience. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's, a, it's a method that God built into the, con to the soul itself. Mm -hmm. The conscience allows the soul to receive truth from God no matter what its condition. Yeah. So, so it's, it's only a receptor. Yeah, that's all. That's all it is. It, when we say it bothers us, well, the conscience can't really bother us technically. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't have any other role than to just inform us of truth, and it's a mechanism. It's a it's an inbuilt mechanism. It's a bit like saying, you know, you know, um, in a car, does the does the uh, piston of a car bother the car? You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just a component of the car. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't bother the car, you know. If it's broken, then, you know, or something's wrong with it, now, now of course, it's going to impede the operation of the car, but it's just a component. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have its own thoughts and its own feelings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the feelings and thoughts that come via the conscious are God's thoughts and God's feelings. Yes. Right, so, so we need to bear those things in mind. So, and then the feelings I might have in response to that ah, are well, my ah, own. Yeah, there are the things that might bother me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because most people on the planet are bothered by their own emotion in some way, aren't they? Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> so, of course, those things might bother me. But, yeah. but the conscious mechanism itself technically doesn't bother you. Mm. It's just a mechanism. It's just a component of your soul, mm -hmm. and that's all it is. So, so the conscience itself doesn't have the capacity to bother us, and God doesn't have the capacity to bother us. Everything God's going to share with us, God knows is for our happiness. So God doesn't bother us. <laughs> if we're bothered by, so-called, you know, mm. distressed by God's truth coming via the conscience, then it's our distress. Yeah. There's, some, there's something going on where inside of us where we're in disharmony with mm -hmm. the conscience itself, you, the truth that's coming via the conscience. 
and we don't want that truth. Mm. And, and so we're trying to fight it and resist it and push it away and keep it under wraps and deny that it's there. And all those other things are all uh, you know, part of that. Now, from a, so from a technical perspective, the conscience can't bother us. Yeah. But there is some uh, sort of some truth to this concept of the conscience bothering me in mm -hmm. the sense that when we do something out of harmony with what we know to be true, yeah. emotionally, we get distressed. Yes. And that's a good thing. It's, it's, it's not because of the conscience. It's because of compensation mm. that that happens. Mm. So when we emotionally feel distressed because of what we did, that's the laws of compensation operating upon mm. our soul, not our conscience. <laughs> but we call it the conscience for some reason. I don't, you know, that, yeah. it's just a, I suppose it's a lot to do with how it feels. Yeah. Um, so, you know, to, when somebody says, oh, my conscience is bothering me, it's compensation that's bothering you. Yeah. And, 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 and the beauty, it's good that it's bothering you because you've now got an awareness mm that you made a choice of decision that was out of harmony with love or truth. And that's why you're bothered. Yeah. But that's a compensatory effect of, of, of us ignoring the conscience. It's not the conscience itself. Yeah. Mm. So, so what about people who, um, who I meet who've heard divine truth or, or just people in general, and um, they sort of have an awareness so that they will speak about look i did this thing and you know it wasn't right in what them you know they might not say it that directly but there's clearly an intellectual awareness that the thing that they did is not it's not right in some way but you i can feel in that person that there is no bother about that not on an emotional level there's an intellectual acknowledgement of it but there's no bother there's no emotional turmoil about the situation. Yeah. So that would indicate that person is really in strong denial of their conscience, does it? Or just that they could be just very shut down emotionally? They're both in strong denial of their conscience and strong denial of their emotions mm -hmm. and strong denial of compensation. Mm. Because, because, you know, there, we, we need to stop, you know, as I keep saying to everyone around us, stop telling me you know something Mm -hmm. when you don't do it. <laughs> so if you haven't stopped the same action, yes. and if you ha haven't been cut to the heart of, about the action, yeah. then the you don't action. know. Yeah. You don't know. Yeah. You just think you know. Yeah. And thinking you know is a very dangerous thing. It's an arrogant position, actually. Yeah. Thinking you know when you don't know. So, so really here you're talking about if you have awakened to the sin emotionally, mm -hmm. then it's going to be much more difficult. And it sounds like you're saying impossible for you, impossible. for you to re-engage the same sin. Yes, completely impossible. If you actually know the truth about it in your heart, mm. it is completely impossible to engage the sin again, ever. That's interesting. Period. Yeah. Hmm. So the fact that people repetitively do the same thing yes, and they say, oh, no, I'm doing it. No, you don't. You don't know the full ramifications of what you're doing. You don't understand the full ramifications. You don't get it in your heart because if you really got it in your heart and you really felt it, which is an operation of being sensitive to compensation, mm. not your conscience, mm. if you really felt it, you would never do it again, Yeah, ever. So... Um so clearly there's some people who, some of us who uh, have some awareness intellectually of our sin and then we use, uh, we engage it and then we use this method of trying to prevent ourselves from doing it again by kind of emotionally berating and self-punishing and treating ourselves badly. Yeah, none when of in, that is an indication that you know. No. It, that's because a, in fact it's all unloving behaviour. It, yes, so, this is now we're sinning again. We're, we're, we're doing a lot again. of things almost to pay for the sin, and sometimes you've got to be careful that you're not trying to pay with guilt in order to re-engage the same sin again. But, but even the desire to pay for a sin like that mm. is a, is it driven by unloving beliefs and thoughts. Yes. But, but even worse than all that, if you look at it, now we're talking about the issue of awareness. Yes. Really. And so we're on a different subject. You, but, yeah, but, but if I could just say, 
14 years ago, I wrote some letters that is on our site that a lot of people have probably never read because it's 14 years ago yeah. about the process of awareness. Yes. And it goes through intellectual stages and then it goes through emotional stages. But stop telling yourself you know something when you've only gone through an intellectual stage of awareness because mm. you don't know anything. Mm. It's only after you've gone through the experience emotionally. Yeah. That's when you know. Yeah. That's the time you will actually know. So we've got to stop using the term awareness with intellectual knowledge. It's just intellectually understanding that perhaps, because that's, that's really all it is, because we don't believe it in our heart. Because if we believed it in our heart, we'd already be stopped, our sin. If we believed in our heart that it was a sin, we'd have already stopped it. Right? But there are stages of awareness towards the sin. Yeah. I do admit and agree with. Yeah. But, but that is not knowing. Once you know that it's a sin, you will have stopped the sin. Yes, and I, I don't disagree with you. I'm just trying to clarify that for our viewers a little bit about what you mean by knowing, because it's... Yeah, knowing is not an intellectual idea or a concept or, or, or Jesus told me, so now I know. No, it's not like that. Yeah. It's not like that. Even God told me, so now I know. It's not like that either. No. You don't know what God tells you. Yeah. God's in giving you information. You don't know it yet because you've never practiced it. You haven't put it into effect. You haven't carried it to its conclusion. It's only then, after it's hit your heart and you've gone through the whole heartfelt process sincerely, that you know. Mm. That's it. There's no other knowing. There's no such thing as like, intellectually and knowing something you're talking about knowledge of truth or knowledge of sin or knowledge of knowledge anything. of anything yeah like you know it's like oh i know how an atom works no you don't like <laughs> really like you really like you know you've been told it you've been educated but you don't know when when you see it and you feel it and you can see it in operation and at a soul level then you'll know mm. but you won't know before mm. and it's just all concepts and ideas in fact, if anything, it's just all information without any real personal uh, application. Yeah. Like you've not you've not been involved in it, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of its creation or the information or or emotionally being involved in the reception of it even mm -hmm. at this stage. The conscience is not about that. The conscience is about allowing you to receive that information. That's all. It's just information. You won't know what the conscience is telling you until you go and do it. And uh, just can you clarify that statement? You, 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 you won't know the truth of what the conscience is telling you until you actually go and practice that truth. So you, you won't, you, you'll hear perhaps if you, you, you'll have an awareness of. You'll hear. Well, let's you, call it hearing because hear, it is a soul based mechanism of hearing. It's not auditory, but no. we're hearing it in yep. our soul, yep. God's truth. And it does get translated into words through our brain and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, mm -hmm. but it's not auditory. No. Yep. Um, so, we, so we hear it, but we won't fully have that knowledge as our own until we go and act on it and in it. We won't it. have it yep. as our own at all, not fully at all until. <laughs> yes until we act upon it, can take it to completion, and it's in our heart, yes. and, and then we know. Then it's our knowledge. Then it's ours. Yes. Then, it, then it's shifted from just being informed about something yep. from someone else yep. to being an informed individual because you know because you've done it. Yeah. There's a big difference. Big and and it's, like, it's like the difference between talking about running a company and actually running one. The yeah. difference between talking about running a marathon and actually running one. <laughs> the difference between talking about anything and actually doing it. Or even knowing <laughs> the mechanics or the theory of what's involved in yeah. anything and then actually doing it. Yeah, and on this planet today, there are millions and millions of so-called experts that have never done it. Yeah. Never done something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, and it's, it's a big trap to get into searching the internet to get advice because most of the people who are giving that advice haven't actually done it themselves. Yeah. That's the irony. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> and so naturally, they, they're, all, they're just regurgitating information for someone else. And this is the same in universities and everything. A lot of the time, it's all regurgitation of someone else's information. Someone else's experience. Someone else's experience. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And we've got to see it for what it is. It's not a bad thing. No. We've just, just got to stop telling every, everybody and ourselves that it's us. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. We're just going to say, no, I heard this, you know, I heard that. But yeah. I, I don't know because yeah. I haven't done it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 
Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> So is it possible to be without a conscience? Yeah, now this is a very good question, isn't it? Because it, there are a lot of people who say that, isn't it? Like a psychopath is without a conscience mm -hmm. type of thing. And no, it's not actually possible technically. Because if you think about it, the conscience is a, soul, is a soul component. It's a component that's built into everybody's soul. <laughs> yep. It's a structural part of your soul. Mm -hmm. You can't be without it. Yep. All right, so... So we know, you need to understand because it's a structural part of our soul, there's no such thing as being without a, soul, uh, without a conscience. Mm -hmm. However, there is such a thing as acting as though we don't have one. <laughs> yeah, it's just seeming as though we don't have one. Certainly. And, and, uh, and, uh, and attempting to act as though we don't have one. Yeah. yeah. You know, there are many people on this planet, millions of them in fact, mm. who have a strong desire to act as if they don't have a conscience. Well, and really that goes to what I was talking to you about in the previous question. That's what I was referring to. When somebody is stating something that is clearly immoral or unethical and they have seemingly zero, um, well, in the previous example, maybe they had some intellectual awareness, but sometimes people just have zero awareness. Uh, uh, of all zero, of the factors about that particular yeah, sin. Yeah, uh, the understanding of sin. Mm -hmm on any level, mm -hmm. um, despite evidence to the contrary. You, you mm -hmm. know, I understand mm -hmm. some people are kind of ignorant and detuned, but mm -hmm. in this case, you know, where it seems that all of society is screaming at a person, this is a wrong thing that you're doing, and they seemingly have no qualm. No, so it's like it. a man who goes around abusing every woman and all society saying you're doing the wrong thing. Yeah. No, no, he's not. Yeah. He doesn't yeah. think he is. Yeah. 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 Um, so it seems as though people are without a conscience or so how does that happen, really? Is the yeah, well, there's a lot of uh, how the reasons why that might happen. And a lot of the reasons are individual to the person, like choices the person themselves has made. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's the choice to detune from your emotions. There's a choice to become desensitised. There's a choice to uh, feed your own addictions. There's a choice to only meet your own desires and not care about anybody else's. There's the, you know, these are, these are all choices that we make. Yep. And they're not, we can't blame anybody else for those choices. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole set of things that other people are partly culpable for. So our parents brought us up to believe specific things. Mm -hmm. and, and that is also some causes as to why we would detune ourselves from the conscience mechanism and act as though we don't have one. Yes, and so, but let's talk now about the extreme example because there must be some serious factors that happen in these seemingly extreme examples sure. where it seems impossible to reach a person uh, about the matters. So, so in those cases, would you say that there's a combination of factors set up? Um, obviously, the ground for that is laid in childhood. Yes. Yep. Usually. It, yep through what heavy addictions in the yes and, and, and it might not be abusive uh childhood it mm -hmm. might in fact be the opposite what or seemingly the opposite where the child is given everything they want without any consideration for anybody else in fact Which a large abusive, amount of really. psych yeah <laughs> but a large amount of psychopathic behavior results from a person in their childhood being given everything they want mm. and there being no restrictions and no boundaries placed upon them yeah so so it's not and not just because of abuse. It's often mm. the opposite of yeah. that, where the parent has tried to give the child everything without yeah. consideration of the child's development and how that's going to affect the child's development in later life. Which I do think is abusive. Of course it's abusive, yeah. but not, not, that's not, not how people see sense. it. Yeah. It's not how people on earth see it. They think, oh, I just did everything for my child and look what they've turned out to be. Yeah. You know, yeah. As if they didn't play a part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so obviously that sets up a lot of addictions in the child that they think are perfectly reasonable. Heavy addictions. Yeah. Heavy yeah. addictions to avoid emotion as well. Yeah. Addictions to avoid everything that they think is something that they shouldn't have to deal with. Yeah. You know, these are these are the kinds of things that cause psychopathic behaviour. Yeah. And and at the end of the day, of course, a person who's so so called psychopath seems to be without a conscience, but they're not. Mm. They have a conscience mechanism still within their soul, but they have heavy, heavy amount of detriment, both that they've chosen to have for themselves. And that has been inculcated in them from childhood. Mm. Mm. And and what role do spirits play in that uh, in that dynamic? Oh, they love that kind of person because yeah. every spirit who is dissatisfied with their life on earth 
and wants to re-engage their life on earth in some destructive way now has a mechanism by connecting to this person mm -hmm. to 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 do anything destructive without feeling bad about it yeah right yeah. so so they love these kind of people you know so these kind of people are heavily spirit influenced and usually frequently possessed yeah by spirits like yeah. you know the, the spirits and them are sharing in this psychopathic behavior mm, mm. Mm, mm, very mm. extreme hey? mm. okay thank you can the conscious mechanism be damaged in some way? Yeah, well, it, 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 this is an interesting question from a technical perspective. Yes. Because from a technical perspective, the conscience cannot be damaged. Mm -hmm. And wh what I mean by that is, remember I said earlier in earlier answers to your questions, that the conscience itself is a component of the soul. Mm. Now, the soul, God created perfectly. Mm. And it's, everybody's soul is still perfect in its way it's been created. So in its... In its function. In its operations, you yes, mean? They, yes, it operates perfectly. Yes. Every single time for every single person. Mm. Everybody's soul operates perfectly. Yes, <laughs> because... And that... that that's really why I place this question in because we we talk a lot about soul damage so it, we need to really specify what we mean by soul damage in a way don't we because Correct. we're saying you know the conscience can't be damaged and the operations of the soul actually can't be damaged so what does it actually mean then soul damage so to, if we define soul damage now the soul damage is emotion mm -hmm. whether it's being caused by ourselves in disharmony with love or somebody else acting in disharmony with love yes it's emotion that's now stored within the soul mm -hmm. that we are unwilling to release yeah that now causes the, the the soul perfectly responds to it yes but but the soul itself becomes damaged in its flow of energy mm. And that's what we mean by soul damage, the mm -hmm. damage that is a result of the, you could say, things that shouldn't be in the soul <laughs> still being there. Well, it, so um, I guess what I'm thinking of as you're talking about that is that, you know, obviously one of the gifts of the soul, or one of the, the qualities of the soul is this aspect of will and desire. And so, uh, because that's, it's, it's almost like the operation of the soul is under the control of the creator of the soul. Uh, the mechanical operation yes, of the soul. Yes, the mechanics of it. The, the laws, you, you say it better, the laws that govern the operation of the soul are, are God's laws. Mm -hmm. And therefore all perfect. And never malfunction. Never malfunction. No. Mm. Um, Whereas the the will and desire aspect um, enables us to uh, impact upon um, how would you describe that? It's it, it's not the functionings of the soul because it's still functioning perfectly, but we we have we do have some control over what is stored and what the is. The best way to illustrate it is through some kind of illustrations, probably. Mm -hmm. So it's like getting buying a brand new car. Everything works perfectly. There's not a thing that's on it that's broken yeah not one single thing yeah and so what do we do we take it out bush bashing in yes. the mud and it, it gets sprayed and covered in mud and we hit a tree here we bash this there and the undercarriage gets scraped and whatever else happens and this is what we do with our soul we basically yeah. abuse yeah. it right yeah. <laughs> and and then we come and drive it back into our car park you know yeah. and we look at it and go boy it's pretty damaged how how why did god make me a damaged soul <laughs> <laughs> but you're saying in that analogy that you just used, the car's still running perfectly. The car, when it was supplied to us, yeah. was perfect. And all of its functionings, mm -hmm. right, are perfect, mm -hmm. right, in its, in its operation. If you hit it too hard, if you go beyond its design limits, you're going to damage it. Yes. Every time you choose to make a choice or somebody else makes a choice to take your soul beyond its design limits, mm -hmm right it's going to have some damage in it and one of the biggest design limits are that if you store negative emotion in your soul it's going to severely disturb its operation it's like it's like in a car's fuel line if you it, if you leave it nice and open it'll always flow but if you put a kink in the wire and put dirt in the fuel and sugar in the petrol tank of course it's not going to go very well right and this is what we do with our soul too well and to me it's more like uh then i don't like your analogy because i keep thinking of the car breaking down and really we're saying that the soul can't break down 
um, it, but it's more like a mathematical equation. Like given given one input, there's this capacity of the soul. Given another input or another use of will and desire, there's a whole other capacity of the soul. Yep. But each is operating perfectly according to what we input. And, and it's under our control. Yeah. It's under gotcha. our control. Yeah. God has designed the soul to perfectly respond. It's not like a car in that it, it can fail. Mm. The soul can't fail. Mm. It, 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 it perfectly responds to everything, to yeah. every input, to every you know, blockage, to everything that we do to it. Yeah. it. It responds perfectly and the laws respond perfectly. So the only way that soul damage can be created is through either our own unloving choices or the unloving choices of others. Um, and so, and that those unloving choices of others is when we haven't had a developed will. In particular then. Yes. In particular then, because obviously we don't have the capacity to reject their unloving choices. Yes. Obviously as adults, we have the capacity to think uh, more, more in a more highly developed fashion mm -hmm. and have the capacity to reject the unloving choices and suggestions of others. But as a child, we don't have a developed brain, a developed intellect, so we're absorbing a lot of these emotions that come from our environment without having a capacity to reject them. Mm. And, mm. and so that's where a lot of our damage comes from. But it's not, it's not the majority of our damage. Yeah. The majority of our damage actually comes from our choices. Yeah. In fact, and that's why we said earlier in another question that getting rid of the harm we do, you know, others have done to us is quite easy. Yeah. Right. In, so in other words, I'm saying getting rid of the harm that your parents did to you is quite easy in comparison to getting rid of the harm that you've caused others. Yeah. That is very hard. Yeah. And the soul has been designed that way, actually. Yeah. So that, so that it's easy to get rid of what other people have done to you and more difficult for you. You have to go through a much deeper and more sincere processes in order to face what's been, what you've done to others. It's, that's a far more just system. It makes more logical sense mm. in terms of justice. If we go back to the conscience then, we talk about the inputs affecting the capacities of the soul. What we've established so far in our discussion is it doesn't matter how much crappy inputs we put into this equation and we diminish the capacity of the soul in other areas, the conscience mechanism will always be operational. Yeah, it's like, it's like the emotional pathways in the soul are all operational. Yeah. You just block them up. Yeah. You, you, what you choose to do to them blocks them up. <laughs> yes. So then can we say that my current soul condition, which is a combination of my will and my desires, um, and what's happened to me, remember? And what's happened to me, what's mm. stored within me, which affects my will, yeah. and then my desires. Those two, those three things can then impact upon how in tune I am, how much, how in tune I am with my yeah. conscience. So but, now we're talking about sensitivity to conscience. Mm -hmm. but the question here was about, is it possible we're without conscience? Damage it. It was to damage it. Oh, was it? Yeah. Well, oh, yes, that's right. Yeah. We're up to yeah. damage it. You can't damage the mechanism itself, but you can certainly act as if it's damaged. Yeah. Certainly you can. Yeah. And you can, your, your sort of the soul damage that we talked about can impact upon how sensitive you are to your, to your conscience. Yes. Yeah, or to the conscience. Yeah. 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 So, so we need to understand that, yes, every time I deny my conscience, I'm trying to detune from it. Mm. Uh, you know, that obviously is going to cause me damage of some kind. And every time I choose to do that, it's going to be easier to do it the next time. Mm. Right. Because I've already managed to do it once. It's going to be easier to do it again yep. and so forth. So naturally, the mechanism itself, while it can't be damaged from God's perspective, God's always supplying truth to it. Mm. It's like God never ceases to supply truth to it. Yeah but we can cease to hear it. Yeah, yeah. We can uh, damage the sensitivity that we have, mm. yeah. We can yeah. cease to hear it, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Very good, thank you.